Hello everyone, this is Cobain the Christian. Today, living in the 21st century, we have inherited a narrative that is relatively old, which began soon after the Newtonian, era, uh, Newtonian revolution. And that narrative goes something like this. Before the scientific age, people needed to invoke God or the gods as an explanatory tool to explain why there were things like sun, uh, thunder, why the sun rose and set, why the moon stayed in the sky. But then, beginning especially with Newton, who explained, quote-unquote, why things move the way they do, with gravity as his tool, we have discovered more and more that we no longer need God. Now, this narrative is wrong from beginning to end. And today, we're going to continue our series on C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, or more accurately, cosmic trilogy, and we're going to see how Lewis restores to us the sense of personality which animates the creation, not only God's personality, but the personality of a great celestial commonwealth, which includes not only human beings and animals, but also heavenly beings of a thousand forms. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of this subject, I want to uh, note again uh, my desire to reduce the number of advertisements in the videos. I know they are obnoxious. Now, I don't set them manually. I could reduce them manually um, if I wanted to. Uh, but the thing is, to invest the time and energy um, required to produce and maintain um, five to seven hour plus lectures on complex topics, as a number of people have encouraged me to do, and as I hope to do, uh, I have to have YouTube as a principal source of income so that I can pay for insurance, rent, so forth. If I had a full-time job, I just would not have the energy to do the amount of content production that I'm doing right now. Uh, so I've been very moved by the amount of people who have made contributions through Patreon. Um, nevertheless, at this point, and we're early in the game, uh, a very significant portion of my income is coming through the AdSense program. Actually, uh, it's much more significant than I had expected it to be, just in terms of absolute value. Um, my hope is that at some point I'll be able to pay most of my bills through contributions um, on Patreon and then on Anchor as well, uh, and then reduce the number of ads progressively until at the end of the day, my goal would be to make all of the YouTube income through Patreon and Anchor and thus be able to remove ads altogether. Uh, if you find that the ads make the videos unwatchable, uh, try to listen to them in the podcast form. And the podcast form is generally uploaded within 12 hours of the video being uploaded. And uh, it's being distributed on several different podcast platforms. The primary one is Anchor, but Anchor very helpfully distributes it to other platforms. Now it's on Spotify right now, and it's on Google Podcasts, it's on several other platforms as well. So in light of that, uh, if you have not made a monthly contribution, if you are financially in a good position, please consider doing so. While most of the content is and will continue to be free, a contribution of 10 or more dollars a month guarantees access to all content, as well as guaranteed answers to your questions in monthly Q&A videos. I'm going to be sending out a, a message to all of my premium subscribers uh, asking for their questions so that we can get to making that video or video videos for this month. Uh, if $10 is too much, please consider uh, making a contribution of 99 cents through Anchor. Anchor provides an easy and intuitive way to make a contribution of 99 cents, less than the cost of a soda from a vending machine. Well, individually, these, con these contributions are small. They add up very quickly and are very much appreciated. In any case, whether you're a contributor or not, thank you so much for watching these videos. And I ask that all of you remember me in your daily prayers. Uh, my name, um, my Christian name is Seraphim, and also for Orthodox Christians, please include my name in the diptychs so that it might be commemorated through the Eucharist. Okay, so in the future, I'm going to have a pre-written, like, uh, contribution message at the beginning so that we can shorten those up. Uh, but I did want to say what I said through the community post the other day in the video. And with that said, let's get into the nitty-gritty of this important and very exciting subject. So... Here in this slide, I have quoted a passage from the first of the Space Trilogy. This is from Out of the Silent Planet. And to give you a little bit of context, basically what's happened is that the protagonist of the narrative, Ransom, has arrived on Mars, which is called by its inhabitants 
Malacandra, terrified that he's going to be offered as a sacrifice to the intelligent inhabitants of this world. Uh, the intelligent inhabitants are called the Sorns. But what he discovers soon afterwards, as he runs from those who had kidnapped him, is that there are other rational beings on Malacandra besides the Sorns whom he feared so much. And he spends a significant amount of time with uh, tall, upright, uh, bipedal, but furry figures called Frossa. Uh, the singular is Frost, the plural is Frossa. And in the midst of living with them, he learns the Malacandrian language. The language of the Frossa is the lingua franca of Malacandra as a whole, though the Sorns and another being called the Piffeltrigi also have their own native languages. Uh, but Ransom learns the language of the Rasa, and in the process of learning it, he comes to discover a great deal about their culture, their belief system, and they come to learn a great deal about his belief system. Now, going in to his conversations with Harasa, he had expected them to hold what he considered to be primitive beliefs, beliefs that correlated with his image of the quote-unquote old Stone Age, an animistic system of thinking. The notion of them having belief in a supreme and personal god just completely took him by surprise. And Lewis, through these conversations with the Harasa, gives us a window into the way that he conceives of the cosmos because the notion is that these beings never underwent a fall they live and move as god intended mankind to live and move from the beginning though there is an interesting distinction between the destiny of man and the destiny of these beings which we're going to talk about in the next slide uh, but lewis gives us a window into the language that would be used if one articulates one's way of thinking completely apart from the fall because there's no fog of war here there's no spiritual fog of war we think of Christianity as a belief system. But had there never been a fall, Christianity wouldn't be able to be distinguished as a belief system. It would just be the normative truth about the world, which everybody takes for granted. So let me just read this. The Rahasa found this very difficult. And he's talking about what is he supposed to do. But all finally agreed that he ought to go to Oyarsa. Oyarsa would protect him. Ransom asked who Oyarsa was. Slowly and with many misunderstandings, because he's still in the process of learning the language, he hammered out the information that Oyarsa, one, lived at Meldalorn, two, knew everything and ruled everyone, three, had always been there, that is, at Meldalorn, and four, was not a Horos or one of the Saroni, which is the plural of Sorn. Then Ransom, following his own idea, asked if Oyarsa had made the world. The Horosa almost barked in the fervor of their denial. The people in Thulkandra, that's their word for Earth, not know that Melendil the Young had made and still ruled the world? Even a child knew that. So this is a very interesting category. It's a category which we don't often think of naturally. Here we have a being which is the ruler of their world. He had always been on their world, that is, as long as they could remember. Uh, and he had all the information that was important to know, and he ruled all of them. So naturally, you would think that this is God. But in fact, Oyarsa is not God. Oyarsa is something else. And what Lewis calls the Oyarsa of each planet or of each world is essentially the notion of a planetary archon. Uh, and this comes from medieval cosmology and also, I believe, from biblical cosmology. In medieval cosmology, each of the planets and the planet, the word planet comes from the word for wandering because you look up at the skies and you have all of the stars of heaven. But then there are five planets visible with the naked eye. They look like stars, except they don't twinkle and they move with respect to the celestial background. So they're called wanderers. They're wandering stars. And in biblical cosmology and in medieval cosmology, every heavenly object is correlated with an intelligence or an archon. It's an angelic uh, creature who lives as a creation of God, but who is responsible for administering this particular celestial object. So in Lewis's cosmology, Lewis takes into account here that we now know that the wandering stars are worlds of their own. And this was an idea, by the way, which was in circulation in antiquity. If you recognize the basic fact, which we all recognize, that things look smaller the farther away that they are, 
and we know the sun, then you look at these tiny little points of light, it's actually not that hard of a hypothesis to come to that maybe there are other suns out there, and those other suns are what we know as stars, and thus that there might be other worlds out there. So this is an idea which is in circulation in antiquity, though it doesn't get known for sure until uh, relatively recently in history. So for Lewis's cosmology, he takes into account the fact that you have these planets, these worlds of their own, and he synthesizes that with the ancient medieval view that every celestial body has an archon and in a heavenly ruler. Now, the really interesting thing is that for Lewis, in the worldview of the Cosmic Trilogy, uh, Earth also has or had an angelic archon. And what do you know? That angelic archon is the devil, who was created as an unfalling glorious being, but is set over our world, uh, given the keys to our world, and told to govern it wisely. Now, for traditional uh, Christendom, the devil rebels against God because it is part of the plan from the beginning that mankind, who comes from the dust of the ground, will grow up and be glorified and eventually be given the keys to rule over all creation, including the angels. So in Psalm 8, we're told that man was for a little while lower than the gods, but ultimately is crowned with glory and honor. And Jesus Christ is crowned with glory and honor. This is the point of Paul's letter to the Hebrews. Christ is crowned with glory, and in being crowned, he brings many sons to glory. And the notion of divine sonship, of being adopted into God's family, also has to do with this idea of the heavenly council. The heavenly council is the government room of the world. Now, in the uh, cosmological kind of framework, that we read about in the Old Testament, uh, the inner sanctuary of the temple or the Holy of Holies, it has cherubim right beside God's throne. And these symbolize members of God's heavenly council. Uh, in 1 Kings 22, the prophet Micaiah has a vision of this heavenly council. It's the place where all the decisions are being made. Uh, in Job 1 to 2, we also see the heavenly council. Though at the end of the book, Job becomes wise enough to himself become incorporated into that council and thus make intercession for his three fallen friends. The prophet Isaiah has a vision of the heavenly council in the temple, and Isaiah is made a member of that heavenly council by being uh, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a major um, feature of the biblical concept of prophet. They stand in God's council, they become members of the God's council, and that takes place through the Spirit because the Spirit creates the environment of communion, and it's that environment of communion which is the divine council. Now, this is a little bit of a tangent, but it's kind of interesting. Um, if you think about the devil in the language of the heavenly council, uh, think about the way that uh, some ancient stories work. There's a narrative of the supreme god having created the world. So in the Near East, that's El Elyon, El Elyon, God Most High, and we see God called God Most High in the scriptures. He's associated with the heavens. He's most high. Throughout the world, we see that the supreme god is associated with the heavens. So in China, it's the emperor of heaven. In Mesoamerica, the heart of heaven, so on and so forth. The reason for that is because the sun, moon, and stars signify rule, sovereignty, and authority. As Genesis 1 tells us, God made the sun, moon, and stars to rule the day and the night. So the ruler of all, the one who's supreme over everything, well, that's the god of heaven. Now, in these ancient stories, we find there's a narrative of a young upstart deity on the divine council. And at Ugarit, we find that this deity is called Baal, and Baal rebels against the supreme god, and he successfully takes over. Now, in the Old Testament, Baal is essentially the liturgical representation of the devil. Okay, so the, uh, the idea is that Israel is supposed to be the bride of God, but in Numbers 25, Israel commits adultery, and the scriptures say that they commit adultery with uh, Baal of Peor. Now, Jesus calls the devil Baal-zebub, or Baal-zebub, the lord of the flies. So we see this story, which is kind of satanic propaganda, which says, ah, there was a young upstart deity, and he was so powerful that he overthrew the supreme god. That's the lie that he wanted to spread throughout the ancient world. So for Lewis, Lewis synthesizes this worldview, which was relatively ubiquitous throughout the ancient medieval periods. Note that even in Africa, there are traditions of a divine council with 70 members. 
So 70, I think it's a symbolic number, but its association with the divine council is not just a feature of Near Eastern religion, which indicates it's not a matter of the Bible borrowing anything. It is a feature of that Noachic tradition, ultimately stretching back to Adam and was revealed by God. So Lewis understands the devil as the archon of our world, at least in the literary cosmos of the Cosmic Trilogy. And me personally, I think there's a very good chance that it's actually true in a literal sense. Earth is the birthplace of the human family. I personally don't think extraterrestrial intelligence is likely. So it's not impossible. But Earth is the birthplace of the human family. It is the foremost world in God's great commonwealth of worlds. It is at least the first one to be populated. And then there's a whole vast universe filled with worlds that we can uh, terraform and, and beautify and fulfill our role as co-creators with God. Topic for another video. Um, but as the prince or archon of that foremost world, he would be the most glorious archon in God's heavenly council. So it's an interesting idea. It's possibly true. But I certainly do believe uh, with Lewis that all of the celestial... Uh, objects that we see in the heavens are associated with an intelligence. God gave the creation to angels in the beginning and in Christ mankind is growing up and angels, those who submit to God and are faithful, will joyfully hand over the keys and participate under humanity in the governance and the transfiguration of the creation from glory to glory. So this is a passage from Paralandra. Uh, before explaining, I think, what was really going on in this passage, I do want to clarify a bit what I mean when I talk about that Newtonian inference being incorrect. So is gravity an explanation for the movement of things? No. Gravity is not explanatory in the sense that we think of explanations. It doesn't do the job that we think explanations should do. What gravity is, is shorthand for a description. And this is why the notion of laws of nature is a bad analogy. When we think of something explaining something else in a causal term, generally what we mean is that it functions like a, uh, a tool or a machine. And machines operate in terms of the basic, quote-unquote, laws of physics, and they carry out certain functions. So if we think of a machine which just, let's say, hammers nails into the wall, uh, the motion of the nail into the wall is explained by the motion of this automatic hammer because the hammer has certain qualities in relation to the basic, quote-unquote, laws of physics. And the hammer itself is the efficient cause. An efficient cause means something which changes something else. That other thing, it has the potential to be X, and the efficient cause is what actually makes it X in actuality and not just potency. But gravity and the other quote-unquote laws of physics are not that kind of thing. They don't explain anything. What they do is they describe in very precise and beautiful terms the way that things behave. So why does the Earth revolve around the sun? Why do the planets revolve around the sun? Why does the moon revolve around the Earth? Is it quote-unquote because of gravity? No, not in the sense that we usually use the word because or because. What gravity does is it explains the precise spatial relationship of one thing to another thing in such a way that it correlates rigorously with that thing's mass relative to that other thing's mass. But it's not explaining why that thing is behaving in this way. It's simply giving a mathematical description of its behavior. Now, some people will say, well, Newton didn't understand or explain gravity and why gravity worked, but Einstein did. And they will then say, well, Einstein explained that the fabric of space-time uh, bends and the Earth rolls along the depression in space-time that is created by an object like the sun. And the sun, being as massive as it is, creates a certain kind of depression in the fabric of space-time. And Earth, being as massive 
as it is rolls along that fabric of space-time in a particular pattern. Now this is metaphysically sloppy because when we think about why people are assuming it's an explanation, it's actually because they have the image in their mind of something like a blanket. If four people hold the corner of a blanket and you put a basketball in the middle of it, that basketball will have a depression in the blanket that surrounds it and the depression will be of a certain size and shape. But why does the basketball create a depression of that size and shape? It is in fact because the basketball is relating to the earth in a pattern explained by gravity. The basketball is being pulled towards the earth because its mass is of a certain relation to the mass of the earth. And thus it creates and exerts an influence upon the blanket so as to create a depression. But when we're trying to explain why everything functions in this way, you can't appeal to an analogy which itself depends upon gravitation. And people will twist themselves into knots trying to figure out, okay, well, what is the explanation for gravity? And what they need to realize is that they're asking the wrong kind of question. This is a metaphysical question. It is a question about the nature of causation. Okay, so uh, this is why Sean Carroll, the physicist, is just dead wrong when he says, oh, we've moved past Aristotelian causation. We don't have in our physics textbooks uh, Aristotelian causes. We have differential equations. Well, we don't have those in our physics textbooks because it's not a physical matter. And again, I'm not talking about something which in principle could be explained in the future. So some atheists will then say, well, you're just, uh, this is a matter which we'll keep studying and then we'll figure out in the future. No, in principle, because of the kind of question that it is, what the sciences do is describe things. And they describe things in terms of other things. And we find that the same reason the apple falls to the ground, that motion can be described with the same set of equations that describes the moon's revolution around the earth and the earth's revolution around the sun. So we have a basic description, which is extremely precise, which unifies a number of formerly disparate phenomena. And that, that is its glory and that is its beauty, but it is not an explanation in terms of actually identifying the efficient cause of a change in uh, the creation. Why do things function in this way? When we ask the question, why? Well, here, the activity of God is actually the causal explanation. Because remember, God has all qualities in and of himself. That is what it means for him to be God. So this is why atheism is not the null hypothesis. Because to be an atheist in the modern sense is not to say nothing additional about the universe other than the fact that it exists. Rather, it is necessarily to say something about the universe itself, something which has positive metaphysical content, namely that the existence of the universe in the way that it exists requires no sustenance from the outside, meaning it is self-perpetuating. The if you have no arguments for theism or atheism, the rational position to take would be agnosticism because you are then not making a claim about the inner essence or the ontology of the world. You see, the theist in the classical sense says that God being self-existent, and there are reasons metaphysically why self-existence entails the traditional divine attributes and why these traditional divine attributes are coextensive with self-existence. We're not just saying, oh, well, he's self-existent and we're just going to throw that out there. So you can't just say the universe is self-existent because there are certain qualities about God intrinsic to the concept of God, which go together philosophically and logically in a necessary way with the notion of self-existence. So because existence itself is rooted in God and God is existence, everything that it could mean for a thing to exist is rooted in God, evil being a corruption, and he twist on that basic existence. The creation exists because God is call, always extending himself in relation to the world. He is impressing himself upon the world. And the inner essence of every creature can be found in its being an imprint of that archetype found in an uncreated way in the mind of God. And we've talked about this elsewhere, but if you haven't seen those other videos, the concept of necessity is not an obscure and just made up concept. Think about numbers. Numbers are infinite. 
There's an infinite number of numbers, and they are metaphysically necessary. There is no set of circumstances, which philosophers call a possible world. Possible world is a possible set of circumstances. There's no set of circumstances in which the number two added to the number three, those concepts being what they are, equals six. Mathematical truths are metaphysically necessary. And God's necessity is linked in with the metaphysical necessity of mathematical truths, because mathematical truths are ideas, and ideas exist in minds, and God is the only being big enough, as it were, to hold an infinite number of numbers. And that applies to many other things as well. So why do things move in the way that they do? Why do we have things that are called the laws of physics? What we're really describing is patterns. We're describing the way that things behave in relation to other things. But that doesn't actually tell us what is causing their behavior. And it is because God is constantly sustaining and upholding the world as what it is. There's no existence separated from the concrete qualities of existent things. To say that something exists means that it exists having the qualities that it does. And God is always upholding the existence of creatures in the particularities in which they exist. So a robin has a red chest, and God is always sustaining that robin in existence, always facilitating its having those qualities of color in, its, in the intrinsic nature of the concept. Now God is personal. God is, I say personal, but not person. It wouldn't be wrong to call God a person or a communion of persons because God is everything that we mean by person, but he's also much, much more. Okay, this is what, what underlies doctrines like divine incorporeality. God has no body, not because he's less than a body, but because he's infinitely more than a body. Okay, so God's existence intrinsically includes this conscious awareness to all things. It is infinitely more concrete and rich than our present conscious experience. But God's creative sustenance of everything in the world, he knows everything from every perspective because he is present in every perspective. He is seeing and smelling and touching the world from every perspective and thus creating the possibility for there to be conscious creatures in any given perspective. This, uh, this living quality, this awareness, suffuses and permeates the cosmos. And this is the metaphysical basis for there being archons of particular celestial powers or celestial objects. God, being infinitely personal, sustains a star in existence and he creates in relation to that star a uh, an angel who is created specifically to govern that star so in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth well the heavens in genesis 1 1 refers to the heavenly court it refers to that commonwealth of celestial powers and meister eckhart says that it also can be understood in terms of god creating form and matter and God then progressively throughout the six days informs the raw material which he made in Genesis 1-1. The raw material is a great mass of water because water is the primordial element out of which everything else is made. And as Aquinas says, it's not the only way to articulate the idea of angels, but angels are in a sense pure form. Uh, every angel is its own nature. Okay, so this is important. Human beings are consubstantial. Uh, we all share the same nature, but every angel is species unique. Okay, so every angel has its own nature. So I think one of the meanings of the notion of God creating uh, forms on that first day is that God created all of the angels who would themselves be uniquely suited to a particular creature in the cosmos, whether that creature is a tree or a plant or a star. And we should think about the traditional approach to the world as seeing spiritual reality as suffused throughout everything. 
And Lewis, in a very tantalizing note at the appendix to Out of the Silent Planet, will refer to the idea of spiritual beasts, that is, of beings who are part of that same class as the angels, but relative to the angels, they are like the animals are to us, so that we have this fantastic and rich world of spirits, which is distributed throughout the creation, but it's not all reducible to just this class called angels. You know, as the Shakespeare quote goes, and everybody loves quoting it these days, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. Um, David Bentley Hart, he's written a lot of problematic stuff. I disagree with him on a lot, but he did write a very good article about 10 years ago called Therapeutic Superstition, and I really recommend you guys check that out. Okay, um, so that is the kind of philosophical underpinning for there being this notion of, uh, uh, of archons which govern and permeate the celestial bodies. That is the basis for us saying things like the Archon of Venus actually is the one moving it throughout the sky. God Im is immediately present as the principle of the motion of all things, but he is immediately present within a conscious creature to whom he is always imparting in the process of imparting it, its existence with its unique qualities, he is imparting causal power to this creature. So that both God and the creature whom he makes are immediately present as the efficient cause of things. And that is true for us as well. God is immediately present within us, upholding us as who we are and giving us, as part of our qualities, the power to choose the things that we do. So God is giving me right now the power of speech. Why? Because God has the power to speak, and it is always being given as a gift to me. Okay, so, crowned with glory. Well, this is a reference to that psalm that I referred to earlier, that man for a little while was made lower than the angels or lower than the gods, but he is crowned with glory and honor. St. Paul says that we will judge angels. Now, in the Cosmic Trilogy, we have in the first book, Ransom goes to Mars, Malachandra, and there are three rational species there, which are called now. Okay, so there's the Hrasa, there's the Saroni, and there are the Piffeltrigi. And all of them are good, all of them are subject to God, uh, but all of them have their unique strengths and advantages, and they live in total peace and harmony. But they are all ruled by the Archon of Mars. Now, in the scriptures, history can be divided into two distinct sections. One of them would be the Old Covenant, which begins not with Moses, but with Adam. And the Old Covenant, man is under the tutelage of angels. Now, James Jordan compares this to drill sergeants. Drill sergeants are meant to train officers. And during that period of training, the officer will be subject to the drill sergeant. But at the end of the period of training, the drill sergeant, who had just a few days before been yelling and screaming in the faces of these guys, when the officer becomes an officer, the drill sergeant salutes them and is then subjected to them. So it is like that in the history of the cosmos. For the first four, four millennia of creation history, man was created and then was subjected to the tutelage of angels. And the chief tutor of the human family was Lucifer. Yet Lucifer rebelled against God, and he was not able thereby to revoke his commission because his tutelage of the human family continues because humanity learns about God in the process of fighting evil. But Jesus takes over the direct role as head of the angelic hosts to tutor mankind, and so we meet the angel of the Lord. He's called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Why? Because it is angels who are tutoring humanity. Angels have been given the keys to the creation, and mankind has yet to grow up to receive the keys from the angels. Then in the New Covenant, through the Incarnation, Jesus perfects humanity and brings it to glorification. And so now we know him not as the angel of the Lord, but as the last Adam, as the head of the human family, who has received the keys to the creation as a human being. And we also find in the scriptures that this era of angelic tutelage corresponds to a kind of era of the primacy of animals. As Animals are an instrument to tutor the human family during its childhood in the ways of God. And now that we've been given dominion over all the animal creation, 
we have a different relationship with them. Well, we still individually, in a sense, replicate this process of tutelage that the human family undergoes corporately. So we have a period of childhood ourselves. We have to learn through wisdom, etc., etc. But when the human family is conceived of as a single organism, you have this first period of creation history which is angels and animals, and then this second period of creation history, which is post-incarnation, where humanity in principle has been given the keys to the kingdom. And you can see this in the four faces of the cherubim. The four faces of the cherubim, in order of their correspondence with the history of the covenant, would be the ox, which corresponds to the priestly period. It's the sacrificial animal. Then you have the lion, the kingly period. It's like the lion of the tribe of Judah. You have the eagle, which corresponds to the prophetic period, because prophets... Um, uh, they go from place to place. They're always walking. They're traveling. I, Elijah does this. Elisha does this. Uh, they're going from place to place. Um, they're putting the ground under their feet. Uh, and, you know, the prophetic image corresponds to birds, which are flying from place to place. There are many different ways to prove that. And then finally, you have the fourth phase, which is man. So the human being is the summation of everything else. But these first three faces correspond to the three phases of Israel's covenant history, the Mosaic period, the Davidic period, and then the period which begins with Elijah in the north and Isaiah in the south. And one way you can see that is because in the temple, which Solomon built, of course, during the Davidic period, he builds into it images of only two of the four faces of the cherubim, that is the uh, ox and the lion, because those are the periods of covenant history which mankind had at that point experienced. Now, Lewis... Uh, appropriates this set of themes in this narrative arc in his cosmic trilogy for example you have what i would like to call beast folk in malachandra malachandra is one of these worlds which is called in paralandra the ancient worlds the worlds that were made prior to the incarnation and lewis by the way is operating at this point within the um, kind of conventional date for the history of the cosmos. So in the literary universe of this cosmic trilogy, you've got a, a universe which is billions of years old. So, you know, personally, my views are different from this, but just within the literary universe of the cosmic trilogy, that's what we're working with. So we have before the incarnation, those worlds which have rational beings created uh, have many different forms. They have many different kinds of bodies. They are analogous to human eyes to animals. Uh, so, uh, and... Importantly, they are subject to angels. Now, in the universe of the cosmic trilogy, angels are called the Eldilla. The Eldilla. Note the presence of this word in many other words in uh, the uh, in the cosmic trilogy universe. For example, Jesus is called Mel Eldil, uh, the place where Oyarsa, the Archon of Malachandra, rules from, and he's also his also is called personally Malachandra, that's his personal name when he's outside of Mars. Uh, the Oyarsa of Malachandra rules from Meldilorn. You see that Eldil is in there. It's kind of cool how Lewis uh, puts this all together. So these beings are subject to angels and they have many different bodies. Now in Paralandra, Paralandra is the morning star. That's the name by which it's known here. And theologically speaking, Paralandra is understood to be the first fruits of the Incarnation. And this is part of this grand story that Lewis places the Incarnation within. It's one possible way to conceive of the story of the cosmos. And Lewis shows us how much greater the story might possibly be. What we think of as the divine economy is our particular chapter of the divine economy. And our chapter has the incarnation at its center, and so does this larger story arc. But we see the incarnation as having a much larger cosmic effect within Lewis's vision. So Venus, or Paralandra, is the bright and morning star because when God creates the beings of this world, the rational beings of this world, they have bodies like ours. And when Ransom wonders about this, why do they have bodies like ours? It is because Melendil has become a man. And rationality is the image of Melendil. This is the name for the second person of the Trinity in the universe of the Cosmic Trilogy. Melendil has become a human being. And thus, to create a rational being after his incarnation corresponds with the body which Melendil took on. And what Ransom asks the lady of that world, who is known as the green lady, because she looks like a human woman. She's green, though. She has much darker skin because Paralandra Venus is much warmer. 
Now, he, he, said, he asks, I haven't seen any Eldilla in your world. And she says, well, there are no, no Eldilla in my world because that was the era of the ancient worlds of Malachandry. Now, we will learn that that's not quite true, but in broad strokes, it captures a major truth, which is that Paralandra is part of that theological universe wherein the incarnation has facilitated the growing up of human beings so that they are no longer ruled by angels, but they have been exalted and come to rule these worlds themselves. And Oyarsa is the name for the Archon of these worlds. And look what is said here to the Lord and Lady of Paralandra. They are Oyarsa. You are Oyarsa. Oyarsa Paralandri, the atom, the crown, tor and tenetral. I'll read the whole passage for you here. Okay. The floating lands and the firm lands, she was saying, the air, and, the cur and I think this is the Oyarsa Pal Paralandra speaking, the archon of that world, the air and the curtains at the gates of deep heaven, the seas and the holy mountain, the rivers above and all the rivers of underland, the fire, the fish, the birds, the beasts, and the others of the waves whom yet you know not, all of these Maleldung, puts into your hand from this day forth, as far as you live in time and farther. My word henceforth is nothing. This is the Archon of Paralandra. My word henceforth is nothing. Your word is law unchangeable and the very daughter of the voice. And all that circle in which this world runs around Arbon, that's the sun. You are Oyarsa. Enjoy it well. Give names to all creatures. Guide all natures to perfection. Strengthen the feebler. Lighten the darker. Love all. Hail and be glad, O man and woman, O Yarsa Paralendri, the Adam, the Crown, Tor and Tenetrion, Baru and Barua, Ask, Ask and Embla, Yatsur and Yatsura, dear to Malendum, blessed be he. I mean, here we just see the amazing beauty in which Lewis writes these books. Lewis has a powerful way of communicating to us the image of beauty in his mind by incarnating that imagery in beautiful prose. This is really prose as an art form. And I'm really just utterly taken by this way of speaking. But we see here that the Archon of Paralandra is speaking to the Lord and Lady of that world. Uh, and let me just... Yeah, okay. The Archon is speaking to the Lord and Lady of that world. And what's gone on in the book is the Lady has been confronted by the devil who has possessed a man and who has gone to Paralandra. And what happens is Ransom is sent to facilitate the salvation of this woman. Not the salvation of this woman from a sin she has committed, but the protection of this woman from a sin that she might commit. And it is Ransom who facilitates the protection of this woman because he has become part of the body of the incarnate word. Thus, the incarnate word does his work in and through a baptized person who has become part of the body of Christ. Moreover, we see at the end of the book, the way that the conflict is decisively won is they've had this interminable argument and Ransom says, this cannot go on. He will break her will. She's not fixed in goodness. She could still go astray, though she hasn't yet gone astray. And Ransom says she will, uh, her will will at some point be broken. She's going to disobey the commandment of God. And he kills the body of the possessed person, thus expelling Satan from that world. And Lewis's point here is because of the incarnation, uh, those forms of combat, which we might think to be in a peculiar way non-spiritual, are taken up and sanctified within the governance and the providence of God in the incarnate Jesus Christ, soul and body. Of course, we will talk about this at much greater length when we go, get to that actual chapter. Um, but because the lady of that world has now passed her test, and we learn at the end of the book that the man at the same time had been undergoing a different kind of test. He was being tutored in the stuff of the creation at the same time as the lady had uh, they are now crowned and exalted. That thing which did not happen in our world, Adam and Eve were meant to be crowned and exalted and elevated, but they weren't because of the fall. That which did not happen in our world has happened in their world. But in both cases, the redemption in our world and the glorification with no need for redemption in their world, it has happened through Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, Malendung the Young. Uh, 
and by the way, the bullet points here, don't, don't pay attention to the way that the text is being divided because this is just the division of the text into paragraphs that I found in the HTML section. Okay, so actually I'm going to get the whole thing up. Uh, I think that's, that's all we have. Okay, so this is what the man says to Paralandra. And Paralandra is a personal name here. Note that the personal qualities of the archon of that world are embodied within the creaturely characteristics of the world itself. So in an artist, you find that the artist's personality is embedded and imprinted onto the stuff that he paints or the music that he makes. Well, so also it is true here. God has created many worlds and the personalities of the individual angels who are set over these worlds as archons. And by the way, there are plenty of other Eldila who are not themselves archons, but serve the archon of a particular world. The Oyarsa is just the greatest of the ar uh, the greatest of this class of being. The personalities of Wait, let me uh, let me uh, uh, read the, the actual passage. We give you thanks, fair foster mother. Now he calls the archon of Paralandra, mother, not because the angel is female, but because she is feminine. And there is a beautiful passage, which we will get to in the discussion of the chapter, which discusses the difference between masculine and feminine, the difference between masculine and feminine and maleness and femaleness. So the general class of category is masculinity and femininity. Maleness and femaleness is the specific application of that class to a body. Okay, so every human being has masculine and feminine characteristics. We are all feminine in relation to God, and we are all masculine in relation to the creation. Animal husbandry, for example, but we are all the bride of Christ. It refers to the kinds of relations that one thing and one subject has with another subject. And Venus is feminine. This is true throughout world mythology. Ransom will discover it in a painting on Malacandra that there image of Venus is also feminine like ours. Uh, and remember, in the scriptures, masculinity is protological. It refers to the beginning of things. It's the source. Femininity is eschatological. It's the glorification of a thing. So we find the beginning of the book of Revelation, it's the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, the glorified. At the end of the book of Revelation, it's the bride who takes on all the characteristics of the vision of Jesus Christ we met at the beginning of the book. Well, Malachandra is protological. It is one of the ancient worlds which is subjected to angels. Paralandra is eschatological. It is the glorified form of the, uh, of the world where man rules over angels. So we give you thanks, fair foster mother, said the king, and specific, especially for this world in which you have labored for long ages, as Melendil's very hand, that all might be ready for us when we woke. Remember what I said before, God is immediately present in all creation as the power of causation. When you see something blue, God is actively imparting to it blueness. He's actively imparting to it the power, the capacity to influence the light in such a way that it relates to your eyes and brain as so as to produce the quality of seeing blue. And yet, it is also the case that there are genuine secondary causes, because God is immediately present in every secondary cause to be its power of causation. Continuing the quotation, we had not known you till today. We've often wondered whose hand it was that we saw in the long waves and the bright islands, and whose breath delighted us in the wind at morning. For though we were young then, we saw dimly that to say it was Melendil is true, but not all the truth. This world we do receive. Our joy is the greater because we take it by your gift as well as by his. But what does he put into your mind to do henceforward? So the archon of earth, of our world, rebelled against God. He rebelled against God's purpose to eventually entrust the governance of our world to the human family and not directly to the devil. But whenever any creature conforms to the purpose of God, it is a joy. The angels have a unique joy in surrendering the keys of the creation to the human family. 
It does not bring joy to unlawfully desire power over that which is not yours to rule. And so in doing so, in rebelling against God, the devil sacrificed a unique joy which he might have had. And it is our joy to be subject to angels until the day when we are wise enough to receive the keys. And it is also our joy to then govern the creation with the counsel of the angels when we are prepared to receive that governance. And this is how the Archon of Paralandra replies to him. And remember, she is called Paralandra. It lies in your bidding, Tor Oyarsa, said Paralandra, whether I now converse in deep heaven only or also in that part of deep heaven, which is to you a world. Now, we're dealing here with different frames of reference. This is explained elsewhere in the Cosmic Trilogy, that what seems to be a local dwelling on a world, as in the Archon of Mars lives at Maldalorn, to the Archon himself, he is actively moving through the heavens. He is, and in his movement, the very nature of his activity is such that when he moves, his world moves with him. So in his movement around the sun, he carries with him the planet Mars. Now, I want you to think of this in terms of this traditional imagery. The traditional imagery is you have the god in his chariot riding through heaven and carrying a world with him. And we see this archetypal imagery actually corresponds to the real structure of the world. Mars has two moons. Well, it is a feature of the traditional imagery about the god Mars that he has two horses. Lewis will discuss the relationship between mythology, the myth mythological concepts of the gods, and the reality of the gods. That is, the reality of the archons of these respective worlds. It's a brilliant passage, and I know I say that about everything he writes, but it's true. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to the chapter itself. But I want you to consider in your mind the idea that what we think of as primitive superstition may actually legitimately have something to it. When we look into the heavens, we are not just seeing flaming balls of gas. What we are seeing is a celestial commonwealth which is carried about and moved in relation to everything else by those who might justly be called the gods, as the scriptures call them. The gods, they carry the heavens on their shoulders. They do it freely and in cooperation with God, the creator. And the distinction between God and the gods is that God, the supreme God, the God of heaven, the ruler of all, has all of these beauties and qualities and powers in and of himself. They're intrinsic to him. And every other, every other being has it by his gift. And so instead of putting so much emphasis on a particular word and saying, oh, well, there's only one God, uh, we must recognize that the key question is always, what do you mean by the word that we're using? And so indeed, there is a great celestial commonwealth of gods, and we become gods through divinization. But in every activity, we owe the grace and the glory that we are given to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Supreme God, who gives all other creatures his, himself as a gift. So what the Archon of this world, what Paralandra is asking, is whether she should restrain her activity to just deep heaven, or whether she should also continue to have commerce in the planet Paralandra, to that part of deep heaven which is to you a world. It is very much our will, said the king, that you remain with us both for the love we bear you and also that you may strengthen us with counsel and even with your operations. Note that word operation. I think it has a non-accidental connection with the concept of the divine energies. Now it is by the operation of the Archon of Paralandra that Venus moves. Remember what we said about the quote-unquote laws of nature. All gravity describes, all gravity does is describe the way that things behave. The actual efficient cause for the behavior of celestial bodies lies in the personal activity of God and in the personal activities of his great heavenly host. Now, the analogy of music is, I don't think, accidental. Take a piece of music. If you take a piece of music, you will find that the notes have certain regular relationships. The relationships are in many ways so regular that you could quantify them mathematically. And yet that does not mean 
that the mathematical quantifications in a beautiful piece of music actually cause them to sound the way that they do. You need a person to actively, based on the archetype and form of the music, you need that person to actively play the music and facilitate it in a creaturely way. Now, you look in, into the heavens, and what you see is a great harmonious symphony. God's heavenly host is described in some places as an army, in other places as an orchestra, and in fact, as we've talked about before, it is the reason that these two images are used together is because music and conquest are closely associated. Think about trumpets that are blown in battle. Think about even into like the Revolutionary War period, you have drummers who are going into battle. In the Israelite um, army, you would have an orchestra which went out with the people of Israel, which both represented and manifested the divine presence, because it is in the divine presence that the communion of saints, the heavenly council exists, harmonizing and singing in praise to God in such a way that the praise concretely changes the world. God creates the world by music. I'm so tempted to get into like the etymology of certain words to show how the idea of music is actually um, within it, and I'll just say this. The English word music, it actually comes from the Greek musis. Musis is the spirit which facilitates the creation of poetry. So it's kind of like that which manifests the word. And Plato, in his Ion, has a passage on the various activities of the musis, which I think Paul alludes to in 1 Corinthians 12. But it's just fascinating to me how that actually shows up in our language by the word music. It is musis. So I'll, I'll, I'll cut myself off there on that little tangent. But just keep in mind the coextensive quality of music and army and the Lord of Hosts and so on and so forth. Um, and what the king of Paralandra is saying here is that even being exalted, having been given the crown, he exists in love and harmony with these other creatures. It is not an intrinsic aspect of power that it be selfish. Okay, this is why I have a problem with the idea absolute power corrupts absolutely. It does have that tendency, but it is not necessary that it do so. Power is good. God has all power. And the incarnation, one of its purposes, was to restructure and rewire humanity so that humanity might be in harmony and in line with God's original intention. That humanity might exercise dominion wisely and in a way that manifests love and not self-centeredness. So, the king and queen of this world live and move and have their being in God. They reign over their world through the power of God, but they do so in such a way that it harmonizes with the role of the angels. The angels aren't out of a job. The angels continue to function with respect to the glorified human family. Just think about how we work. We all have a guardian angel. Angels are intimately involved in every aspect of our lives. Every aspect of our lives they are intimately involved with. Angels are a constant reality. <clears throat> we are to be given authority over the angels. And we have that special relationship with our guardian angel. But it is not an authority which is like slavery. It's an authority of intimate friendship. I think we will find at our death that there will be a sense of intimate friendship with our guardian angel. Even though we might think of ourselves as meeting him for the first time or her because masculine, feminine, not the same thing as maleness or femaleness. Um, we will be thinking of having met her, him or her for the first time when we die. In reality, our whole pattern of life right now is cultivating a relationship and a friendship with this being, and we will become cognizant of that when we die. You know, as Lewis in the Screw Tape Letters will describe uh, the protagonist's state of mind when he dies. Ah, it was you all along. One of the things we see here is pretty interesting. Um, we are not yet ripe to steer the world through heaven, nor to make rain and fair weather upon us. If it seems good to you, remain. So one of the things which humanity is meant to grow up to do is to become itself the efficient cause for the regular continued operation of the world. Now, this is the element of truth which has been corrupted in ideas like transhumanism. 
Mankind is in Christ growing up to receive the keys of management over the creation. And technology is an integral part of that. Technology is tool. It's a tool. Uh, computers are just really, really complicated and advanced tools. And in themselves, they are good. We shouldn't be Luddites. St. Porphyrios actually prophesied the Internet. And he said how good it will be when computers talk to each other. So intrinsically, these are good. But the more good a thing is, the more powerful it is, and thus the more dangerous it is. Uh, but part of what I think technology is allowing us and will allow us to do is to exercise dominion in managing the creation, to control the weather. That is not necessarily mankind exceeding his vocation. I think right now God is putting a limit on how much development we have. For example, we've never passed the moon. This is a really interesting point. For the traditional view of the cosmos, the moon is kind of the outer boundary of that spiritual province, which is the Earth. So uh, the portion of the sky that's under the moon, it's the sublunar realm. And that is the realm over which the devil still has sway. But outside of the orbit of the moon is deep heaven. Okay, it's another, these have all the other provinces of God's creation, where these worlds upon worlds are numbered. And it's interesting to me, this is just kind of a suggestion, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but it's interesting to me that we as human beings have not passed the moon. We sent our machines beyond the moon, and it's kind of odd when you think about it. Because we got to the moon a pretty long time ago. And please don't talk about any of the, you know, did we really go to the moon thing in the comments. I'm not closed off to conspiracy theories, so I definitely don't buy that one. But I just don't want it to turn into a tangent. Um, we got to the moon quite a long time ago. Why is that what we've never passed? Just a question. I think it's possible that there is a providential divine quarantine that is preventing us from going through the gate to deep heaven. Because God will not permit us to pass that gate until he has implemented his work of redemption to such a degree that it will glorify the world for us to go to Mars and not wound the world for us to go to Mars. So Paralandra, the Archon, still serves as the efficient cause for the movement of that world throughout deep heaven, even though, as we will talk about in the next video, there will be something like the resurrection of the dead, even in this unfallen world. Uh, the king of Paralandra says, we shall be as the Eldila, but not all as the Eldila. Our bodies will be free of deep heaven. We'll, they'll be able to move directly in those parts of the world which lack air. <clears throat> okay, so I plan to do one more slide, but uh, I think an hour is long enough. We will complete... Uh, our introduction to the cosmic trilogy in the next video i know i said there were i wanted to talk about five major themes but really i'm going to reduce it to four and i'll mention what i thought might be considered the fifth theme but i think is more of a sub theme in my next video and then we'll get into the actual chapter by chapter discussion of the text so i don't make any promises as to when we'll be done with this series it may be that uh, i'll start the series and make a few videos on it then i won't make a couple videos on it for a couple months um but over the years, because I'm always going back and looking at this wonderful series of books, over the years, we will continue to build on this until, God willing, we have done the whole thing. All right. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.